Hi everyone and welcome. Thank you all for being here in this new webinar from CLAT World Languages. Today we're going to talk about reimagining differentiation, simplifying instructional strategies for diverse classrooms. It is my pleasure to present our speaker for tonight, which is Christy O'Connor. She's CLAT World Languages K-12 World Language Sales Consultants, and she's a former educator which, who has seven years of teaching in high school Spanish. She, having received her BA in Spanish from WCSU and her master's in education from Sacred Heart University, she has allowed, this has allowed her to continue her love for language learning. She has experience in curriculum writing as well as professional development in presentations and is very passionate about supporting teachers inside and outside the classroom. Thank you very much for being here, Christy. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for introducing me, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I know how valuable teacher time is, so any of it that is dedicated to me and certainly to Clet World Languages, I know we are very thankful for that. Um, so today, as Sabrina said, we're going to be talking about reimagining differentiation and simplifying instructional strategies for diverse classrooms. So first, just a little bit about me. As Sabrina said, um, I'm a former Spanish teacher myself. I received my bachelor's in education and Spanish, sorry, from Western Connecticut State University, and then my master's in education from Sacred Heart University. Both are located in Connecticut, which is where I reside. Um, and I was a high school Spanish teacher for around seven years. I left the classroom last year, but I continue with my passion for professional development, curriculum writing, and just making teachers' lives easier because I always say we work hard enough. Um, and I'm very excited that I get to work for CLET where I get to continue those passions, including what we're doing here tonight. So the first is just a little agenda about what we're going to be seeing today. Um, first, we're going to go over what exactly is differentiation, um, how we can go about understanding our students' needs to meet those differentiation needs, how to actually go about that differentiation, what are the different processes to actually, you know, apply that, and then what will that look like in today's world language classroom? How can you start putting this to use, hopefully tomorrow? Um, so to begin, let's just go over a brief little differentiation um, definition. Of course, there's a lot of different ones, but this is one um, that I chose that I feel really resonates with me. Um, and it says a differentiated instruction focuses on whom we teach, where we teach, and how we teach. Its primary goal is ensuring that teachers focus on processes and procedures that ensure effective learning for varied individuals. So this is going to be kind of a good guide as to what we're going to be talking about and how we're going to be breaking down what differenti differentiation is and what it could look like in our classrooms. But I think it's always really important to remember that we as a teacher, we the ed educator, our role in the classroom is mediation. Um, how can we get our students from the starting point that we find them when we meet them and get them to the finish line that we're trying to get to and achieve together? Um, so what can we do in the process to mediate and get build those bridges to, you know, fix those gaps? And I think it's also really important to remember that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are so many things that are available to us as teachers now more than ever, um, including obviously, for example, some of the great materials that we have here at CLET. I'm gonna be using this presentation to talk about some of the materials that we have. Some of the examples that you see will be from pages of our materials. Um, but obviously I'm gonna be using a lot of examples from my teaching experience as well. Um, so if, if you have any questions about any of the materials that are specifically mentioned that are from our portfolio, I'm happy to go over those. But it's important to know that there are so many resources at our fingertips that we can utilize to make this an easier process. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. And we need to remember as well that little changes can make a very big difference in our students' lives. So first and foremost, we cannot address the needs of our students unless we truly know what those needs are. So first we wanna go over what are some different ways in which we can go about learning those and finding them out about our different students that we get every single year. Um, so first and foremost, of course, the utmost importance is making sure that we work with our special services department. Um, this is crucial if you have any students who have 504s, IEPs, any accommodations or modifications that are legally necessary, of course, need to be your number one priority. But as I'm sure we know, there are many students who fall through the cracks, who never get diagnosed, who don't have the advocates to make sure that they get those 504s and IEPs 
So we need to make sure that we understand our students' learning differences in general, even if they don't fall into that category of modification or accommodation, and they just need a little bit extra support or even a little bit extra challenge, because of course we know our high flyers are also their own class of differentiation. So how can we go about getting that information that isn't located uh, with our special services department. I think a great resource that is often overlooked are our families of our students. I think not only because they can give us a perspective of our students that we don't see in the classroom that may be at home. Um, they may be able to get information from the student that they're not willing to share with us personally, um, or just because it's just always great to have families on our side to work as our teammates and helping to make our students successful uh, beyond what our reach is in the classroom from those brief hours um, that we have together. But probably one of my favorite ways to find out this information and to really learn a little bit more about our students is surveys. Um, obviously, this works better with certain age groups. Um, obviously, if you're teaching elementary, they may not be able to report as much as perhaps a middle schooler or a high schooler. I worked with high school students, and this was a wonderful thing for me to be able to utilize. But I highly recommend incorporating a variety of surveys into your different practices so that way you can learn more about your students' needs on a regular basis, not just at the beginning of the year. And I'm going to go into some examples about that. So um, first, of course, we want to make sure we're using a variety of surveys and diagnostics. But of course, what does that look like? So like I said, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to say that a lot. There are a lot that are already out there for us. So for example, these are some ones that are included in our material, the reporter series. Um, we have a questionnaire at the beginning of the year, finding out what is the you know experience that our students have with the language? Has it been a positive or a negative experience? Um, for so many students, we know that level one can look different for a lot of different students, especially you know in this pandemic era. What does level one look like to these different students depending on when they were during the COVID shutdown, you know, and a lot of different things can have a lot of different factors. And that's why also I think a diagnostic test is a great resource as well, because that can be a great measurement tool to start off the year strong with evaluating where your students are with the different skills and topics you're going to be covering that year. Um, and it could just be a really great way for not only for you to get to know your students a little bit better, but obviously also for them to be able to report and to demonstrate you what their skills are academically and then also specifically in the actual target language. I think it's also really important to remember that we need to differentiate beyond sometimes necessarily the academic and actually differentiate to the person, not just the learner. Um, I think we now, of course, know more than ever that social emotional learning is so crucial for our students, and that is its own version of differentiation. So I encourage you to really keep that in mind as well as you're designing your lessons and your activities. Is there a way could, that you could be differentiating beyond what your probably first instinct, instinct is with is the target language, the material, the content, and maybe just, you know, the environment of what your students are talking about, what we're going over, how we're interacting, um, being mindful of cultural differences as well as social and emotional differences. This is a great example of something that we have incorporated in some of our lessons. Um, this is one of my favorite examples, which is talking about our students are talking about themselves. We know that's how we start off every material. We want our students to talk about themselves because that's how they can start interacting with the language in a really useful way. Um, and often we ask them to talk about their families and many materials often ask them to do a family treat, which can be a sensitive task for some of our students. So to be mindful of that, to be cognizant of what are the cultural differences, what are the social and emotional differences and backgrounds of our students, I love this lesson where we're not just talking about my family. We're not asking them to draw family tea. We're talking about my circle or my entourage. Who's in my life who's important to me? And I love that because it gives a really great organic usage of the language. It allows for the students to not have those sensitive tags. They can share what feels right to them, like who's important to them. Maybe not just a family, but a coach, a teacher, um, a neighbor, a friend, um, and it also is just a really organic learning process for the vocabulary, um, building your own vocabulary that is what is your conversational Spanish or French or German or whatever it may be. I also think that self-checks, students reporting on their own abilities, is a great resource that we can do. Um, this is a great self-check resource that we have in Reporteros, but I love it particularly because it's so easy to make something like this with things that we're working with in the classroom already. 
For example, we as teachers are constantly creating can-do statements, learning objectives, and why not just take those, list them all together, as we can see here, have our students evaluate themselves on how they feel they are doing with those can-do statements, those learning objectives. And then we can provide, for example, some strategies to help them improve those, like we can see in the right column here. And this can be something simple. Again, it doesn't have to be reinventing the wheel. Your strategy could be for improvement could be study this Quizlet set I created for you, or review this note set that's in X binder or X notebook. Um, just literal, little reinforcements for our students can make a big difference and can help educate us as teachers as to what their needs are so we can better meet them. And like I said, I love, I love, love surveys. I think surveys are such a great way to incorporate not only, again, that social emotional side, making sure your students know that you care about them, you want to know and have, give them the opportunity to report how they're feeling in the class, how they're doing, what are the different materials that they're working with and how they're doing with those materials. Um, but it's, again, really a great reporting tool to help strengthen your student skills and better indicate how you might be able to differentiate for them in the classroom. Um, so these are some examples. I used to, I was a big fan of Google Forms for surveys. Um, they were just so easy for me to put into my Google Classroom. I loved the way it broke down the data for me. So those were something that I used all the time. I always did at least five surveys per year, actually six. Um, so I always did my beginning of the year survey to get to know my students, you know, are there any nicknames you have? What's your experience? Like kind of that questionnaire we talked about earlier. I always have an end of year survey where I ask them about how their experience was with me and how I can improve as a teacher. I will warn you, it's not for the faint of heart, but I really enjoyed it. And I also did four other, which is I did one per quarter that was kind of in this style, which was just a great check-in for me as a teacher to find out how they were doing with the materials. And then particularly how my instruction was helping to support them with their academic progress. So um, these are some example questions and I encourage you, these are really helpful for me and they really surprised me a lot of times how much they supported me in my education process with my students. Um, so a trick of the trade, one, I really encourage you to ask your students how different activities are doing in class and different types of activities are supporting or not supporting their learning process. So a great tip is one, always start your sentence with what you don't want them to answer with, okay? If you put it at the end of the sentence, they will not see it and they will write that answer, okay? So for example, you can see here, I wrote besides Kahoot and Quizlet because I knew all my students loved that. They really enjoyed it. I didn't really want feedback on that specific platform. I wanted to know about what other things were helping their learning process or not helping their learning process. The other tip is definitely put in parentheses, concrete examples of activities that you regularly do in class. So for example, the ones that you can see here, like worksheets, board games, puzzles, individual work, review packets, paired speakings, those were all things that I did regularly in my class on a regular basis that my students would easily be able to pull from memory and say whether or not it helped them. Some students gave examples that were not in this list, but I will tell you, if you don't give them any examples, you will likely get a lot of I don't knows. So if you give them a list that they could potentially, um, you know, choose from, differentiate for them, give them a, a, a word uh, vocab list, <laughs> a word bank per se, um, it will really support them to give you that data and also help you direct your teaching style. And I'll tell you, it will really surprise you. Um, I had some, you know, groups, for example, that asked me for more individual work worksheets. And I was like, what kid is asking for this? But then I found out a little bit more. That was a class that the kids didn't really know each other. They didn't really like hang out that much outside of class. So they didn't really want to do group work and games and stuff. They kind of just wanted to do their own thing. And that was fine. Um, and then I had other classes that they actually loved paired speakings because they had a ton of friends in class. And they wanted to chat with them. And like, if they had to do it in Spanish, then so be it. But they wanted to chit chat. So you'll be surprised how these answers differ from year to year, from class to class. Um, and I encourage you to incorporate them. And certainly the opposite of what does not help you learn. What are the things that we're doing that are not supporting your learning process? I had some years that kids said, we want less games. They just didn't want games. It just wasn't supporting their learning. They just wanted to like really study. And that was fine. And that was great for me to learn that and to personalize my learning according to the students in front of me. 
And then definitely tracking student progress is so helpful. Um, again, we really can't address those needs unless we know what those needs are. And there's so many ways we can go about learning those, especially as we need as teachers to be regularly giving formative checks to make sure we understand how we may need to redirect our teaching and our instruction or what skills our students are doing well or struggling with, or you know, what are the different levels of different groups of students in our classes. And of course, we can't collect everything we can't grade everything over the weekend. We have a very finite, limited time and we need our sanity. So there's a lot of things we can do that can help track that progress for us. One thing is self-correcting work. I'm a huge fan of self-correcting work because it's less things that I have to correct, but I still get the benefit of knowing how my students are doing. So for example, on the left-hand side, this is an example of any of the activities that we can take from our textbooks and workbooks. You can assign them via the online platform and that's gonna give you that graded feedback it's going to get your students getting that instant feedback, that autonomous learning experience, and that ability for them to correct and redirect independently, which I think is a really great skill for us to teach our students. Um, and they're also used to it. You know, students this in this day and age are so used to that instant feedback um, that I think that if we can help support that in the classroom, it's going to really help them to really get that independence and take that responsibility for their learning. Um, another great tool for that instant feedback tracking is Google Forms. Again, I love Google Forms. I pretty much did almost all of my homework via Google Form. And you can see on the right hand side, that's a screenshot of an example of one of my activities. Um, they're great because you can do fill in the blanks. Like you can see this one, I was doing circumlocution with vocabulary. I've done other ones where you're filling in conjugations, just some really great, easy, additional rote practice to help your students solidify those skills and be able to better apply them in the classroom. And again, it's all self-correcting, all self-tracking. So then I get all the answers and the information, but I don't have to do all the extra work to prep for that. Another great thing to track student progress, and particularly these are fantastic for in the classroom, um, are some of those platforms that many of you may be familiar with that can help support you do that. Uh, particularly these two, Pear Deck and Nearpod. Um, I don't know as much about Nearpod. I was a really big Pear Deck fan. I will tell you that um, I don't know as much about Nearpod with this paid subscription or freedom, but I know Pear Deck has a free and a premium version. But I loved what this allowed you me to do in the classroom in regards to understanding my students in the moment. For example, as we know, if we are having our students to do a worksheet in class, typically, if you want to know how your students are doing, you either have to just collect all of them and grade them, which is a lot of work, as we just said, or you're going to probably circle around the room, look over people's shoulders, try and remember who you can and can't call on, who got it right so you can highlight them and maybe not cold call on someone else and embarrass them. And it's just not the most fluid process, and it doesn't give you the best screenshot kind of of how students are doing in the moment on all of the questions because you can't circle a million times and know everything. So what I love about these is Paradeck and Nearpod allows you for um, to take any presentation, uh, particularly I know for Paradeck you could take any Google Slides presentation. They also have excellent templates that are already pre-made. So if you, for example, Again, don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of great things already made for you. Like on the right-hand side, um, that's one that Nearpod already has about Dia de Muertos, um, but you can make your own. So I would take, for example, a direct instruction slideshow or even a practice, and I or just any worksheet that I would have done, I'd convert it into a slideshow and do it as um, you know, a Pear Deck or a Nearpod. And what I love about this is that it makes those presentations interactive. Your students use a code, kind of like a Kahoot, to join, and then they use their device to answer questions in the moment. And particularly for the premium feature of Pear Deck, what I loved is I was able to view everyone's answers in live time and what students were saying. And I loved that. It gave me with just the swipe of, you know, my mouse or my hand, the ability to read the answers of every single student in my class in one swoop, rather than having to circle or collect. So it was easy for me to redirect my instruction to say, okay, I've done three of these questions so far. We keep getting it wrong. Let's go over the rule of what these irregular yo form verbs are, whatever it may be. Um, so I love the information that it gave me. I also really, again, love the social emotional learning aspect. It had a lot of great templates to include certain check-in points for your students to report how they're feeling um, and particularly how they're feeling with the material. You could say, how are you doing with what we just taught? I'm doing great. Keep going. 
I think I'm okay, keep going, or I'm completely lost, please stop and help me. And what you can do with that information, you know, and again, this is all, the students are just submitting it to you. No one else knows in the classroom what they're saying. You can say, all right, I'm gonna pull this group aside of these students who said they need to really stop and help. And then you can put it on student pace mode and the students can keep going through the presentation by themselves and keep answering more questions while you review. And then you can snap everyone back to the same spot and then go over the questions that everyone else just did. So it gives a lot of independence for your students. It gives a lot of flexibility to you as the teacher. Um, and I also, one thing that was really great for me is like I said, it's hard with the whole cold calling thing, especially in a language classroom. I think most of us, you know, for example, for me, I sat in a language classroom. I'm not a native speaker of Spanish. Um, so I know what it feels like to sit in that classroom and feel like you don't have the answer and it's kind of nerve wracking and it's hard. Um, so to help kind of eliminate that anxiety and make my students feel more comfortable in the classroom, I told them, if you get called on and we're doing a pair deck, you better shout that loud and proud because I already previewed your answer and I know you're correct. I'm not going to call on you unless I know you're correct. So it gave me a lot more trust with my students and the opportunity for them to feel more confident with the language and to just feel a little bit more easily able to make mistakes and it'd be okay because Again, it was anonymous to everyone except for me, but I could still show their answer on the board and be like, yeah, look at this one. What, what do we want to tweak about this one? And no one would know there was something that was wrong except for me and that student. Or I can say this one was so fantastic. Jamie wrote this. Everyone, Jamie wrote this amazing answer. Isn't that fantastic? And it was a great way for me to showcase somebody. So there was so much that I could do with this. that I loved this. I personally felt that the subscription fee was worth it. But again, there's also really great free editions that can give you some of those same features. And again, allow you to make things a little bit more interactive and tracking wise for your students. So now that we've kind of go over some of the ways that we can go about learning those things that we need to differentiate for, how do we actually go about implementing that differentiation? So from that same definition of what is differentiation earlier, we're going to break it down into content, process, procedures, and learning environment and seeing how each of those affects differentiation and how we can go about implementing differentiation for each of those different things. So first we're gonna go through content. So what does content mean in regards to differentiation? So this is about really, I like to think of how you're presenting the material. You know, how are you showcasing it to your students and having them interact with it? You know, are you um, having models for when you're showing what they you want them to do? Are the instructions in English or are they in the target language? Do you have sentence starters to help them out? Is there a word bank for them to choose from? Is there a grammatical refresh on the side to help them get a little bit of a refresh before they go into utilizing those? That is what I mean when I'm talking about content. And you can see how adjusting some of those small things, adding or subtracting those, I'm sure as you can imagine, make a very big difference. And many of those things don't take a lot of extra prep time in order to incorporate or remove them. Um, I highly recommend when we're talking about differentiation, when you are talking about adding or removing supports, it is always easiest in my opinion to create your activity with as many supports as possible. Like you wanna create this as like, this is the most differentiated and scaffolded as I can possibly get it. And then as you wanna make other tiers, for example, of ability, you can just start removing those supports. And that's a lot easier, personally, in my opinion, than doing the inverse of starting off like, this is exactly kind of how I want it to be done. So you're like kind of your middle ground. This is how I kind of want it to be done. Now I'm gonna either challenge my students and so I'm gonna add these things to make it a little bit harder uh, and then these students need some support. So I'm going to, you know, maybe add this, this and this as well for these students. I think that that process is not as fluid. It, I don't think it's a supportive to learning process, certainly not supportive to you and your time as a teacher. So highly recommend starting off with the most scaffolding possible and then removing those supports to make it more challenging for those different tiers of ability. Um, so we can see here, for example, these are screenshots from the recorder series in French, and we can see how I'm some of the examples that I was talking about are incorporated here. You know, having some sentence starters um, in our questions for students to be able to rely on and kind of get an idea of what we're expect expecting from them. Having, um, you know, maybe a grammar um, support, you know, maybe just a quick little refresh of what, what we're talking about. How, what are you going to be utilizing here? Do you remember when we went over this? Um, and then sometimes 
getting to the point where we can remove some of the supports. For example, on the left-hand side, that's an example of some questions from unit one versus unit six on the right-hand side. So from the beginning of the level to the end, we can see we're not as providing as many supports because we expect by now our students to be a little bit more independent with the material and being able to do this kind of process or seek out those supports on their own. I think it's also great to see how there's different ways that we can go about doing this. Uh, one thing I really love about the reporter series is that we provide differentiation worksheets for you for every single chapter. So you're going to find three different tiers. The textbook is, again, your middle of the road. And then you have option B, which is an accommodation, and option B, excuse me, option A is an accommodation, and option B, which is a challenge. So how do we get those different scaffolding levels and how can you create your own kind of activities and scaffold beyond maybe what we're providing to you? So let's take a little bit of a deeper look as to what that looks like in some of these activities and how you could structure some of that with your activities as well. So as we can see, this is the middle ground. This is our textbook activity. And um, for my non-Spanish speakers, I apologize. Uh, but this is an activity where they're talking about the verb gustar, which if you don't know, um, means to like, but it doesn't really mean to like. Um, in Spanish, there is no equivalent for the verb to like. We only have the verb to be pleasing to. And since that is the actual meaning of the word, it doesn't conjugate the way a normal verb would because it's not saying I like ice cream. It's saying the ice cream is pleasing to me. And therefore you have a subject change. You need a pronoun. Um, so it's often very challenging for students to comprehend that, that there is no direct equivalent. I know that Italian has... Um, a parallel piacere is the same kind of thing. You need to form it in the same way. I spoke with my German colleagues. They said that there's not really an exact um, translation or an exact equivalent for that kind of a thing. You guys have a regular verb for like. And then for my French colleagues, they said that uh, plech, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong, P-L-A-I-R-E, is similar in formation to that um, and kind of follows those rules. So that's what our students are practicing here, this verb to be pleasing to. Um, and to talk about their likes and their dislikes. So this is, you know, they're asking about, do you like music? What kind of music do you like? And they're also doing a reading where they're looking at some other students and what their likes and dislikes are in regards to music styles. So now, how can we differentiate that? So now we're looking at option A, which is our, again, our accommodation. So how did we accommodate? What did we do to support our students and provide to them? So we can see we separated the question into two separate questions um, so they could focus on one at a time. We um, also offered, as I said, a grammatical review. We are going over and doing a quick little recap of like, what does the verb gustar look like? How do we utilize it? How does it look in a sentence? How could you potentially use this to model after your own sentences? And then when we go to option B, which is again our challenge, now we have those two questions merged into one. So we're kind of implying to our students that they should ideally merge these two ideas, maybe use a conjunction, and so get a little bit deeper into their skills. And then we can see on the bottom, they see when do you use the form uh, gusta and when do you use the form gustan? So now we're not providing a, a support. We're asking them to support us with that grammatical structure. Tell me how this works. Show me your understanding. Show me mastery by being able to teach it to others. Um, so again, some of these things, you don't necessarily have to put a ton of uh, prep into making these adjustments. You could easily take the same activity and make these small adjustments yourself with very little additional prep time. And I think that that's a big thing to remember is that I think when we think of differentiation, often it seems to be this very daunting, overwhelming task but we can do small things, like I said, that will make big changes to our students. And I promise you, these small changes will make a huge difference in your students' ability to interact with this content and feel either uh, you know, more successful and more confident moving forward as they continue with these grammatical structures. I think another thing that's really important to remember uh, particularly for my Spanish teachers here, is our heritage speakers. Um, our heritage speakers are their own class of differentiation. They have their own distinct needs um, that are very different from when maybe you might be used to or may have been taught about differentiation. I think particularly for our language group here, you know, when you go to a conference and you're learning about differentiation, um, they often are just talking about differentiation in general. They may not understand what differentiation looks like in the world language classroom. And so this is a very specific group of differentiation that you know, so maybe some other teachers may not have to deal with these specific 
you know, challenges. Um, and there can be a lot of different things that a heritage speaker may need to work on that they need their own differentiation. Um, some students can, we know, receive really well. They totally comprehend everything when they're listening um, and they're interpreting. They are fantastic about that. Some can understand and speak, but maybe they were never taught how to read and write. Maybe some just need a little bit extra proficiency and polishing for their spelling and their grammar. Um, maybe some just need to be, um, that we want to give them a little bit more of a global perspective, show them some more lexical differences in the different regions and how many variations there are of the Spanish language, as well as culture from beyond the country that they learn from that heritage experience. There's so many different things. Um, and that's why I love as well that we offer in our reported series, these heritage documents Again, going over the same type of topics, we want our students to be engaged and on the same kind of level, but we want to meet them where they're at and give them what they need. So maybe having them go over like a video or maybe have them do a different activity where they get to do a little bit more independent exploration on the culture that we're talking about, or maybe doing a writing or a reading activity is going to help polish those activity, those skills that we talked about. Um, really deepening and helping support them while also making sure that they're engaged and maybe even just giving the opportunity to share how their culture differs from the one that we're talking about in class, if they feel comfortable. All right, so now we're gonna transition over into process. So what does process look like in the differentiation um, you know, sequence? I like to think of process as making sure that accessibility to the material is key. Um, you know, making sure things are, uh, clarity is should be your utmost priority. Um, and then also, you know, giving additional supports to help make sure that students can access and feel confident with the language as they're moving through it. Um, so for example, here, using Google Classroom as a great way to supply, or not even just Google Classroom, any LMS that you work with. I use Google Classroom, so I know it really well and I use it as a, as a reference. But, you know, for example, anytime I did any direct instruction for any grammatical, you know, topic, any sort of, you know, maybe vocabulary direct instruction, what anytime I had a PowerPoint presentation, my students knew that there was going to be, by the end of the day, two copies of that same presentation in Google Classroom ready for them. There was going to be the one we did in class that was blank and maybe I was having them fill out. And then there's going to be the fully filled out version. And the reason why is because I, I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Sometimes you're going through the notes and kids are like, wait, wait, can you go back? I didn't get to that. And you're like looking at the clock. And you're like, I really got to get through this. But you know they need that information. Or you know there's kids who don't feel confident enough to say, wait, go back. And they'll never say it to you that they needed it. So you want to make sure you're meeting those students, even if they don't have the ability to speak up and say that for themselves. And by posting those versions of the notes, the filled in version, you're going to make sure that your students feel confident that they know if they're not keeping up, they're okay. That if they have dyslexia or, you know, maybe they have a visual impairment, they can't see the board. Maybe they just have someone next to them that's distracting them. Maybe they're just having an off day that they will still have accessibility to that material later on so they can go back and they can review that with them by themselves or ask for you to go extra help and give them that accessibility or go over it with them. I think another great thing we can use um, to help aid in process, and again, that accessibility feature, um, are the audio transcripts. Um, so many of us use materials and things that have transcripts embedded in them. Even, you know, YouTube videos, we can look at the captions and things like that. They may, they may not always be reliable, but we have transcripts for all of our audios and our videos. And this is a great thing to provide to students who, again, making sure we're meeting those 504s and IEPs for any auditory processing difficulties. They can also help aid and deepen comprehension for those students that may be more visual than auditory learners. This also, again, you can utilize this as a tool of flexibility for you as the teacher that you can take any listening or viewing activity and modify it into a reading activity with no additional preparation because you don't have to type this out. It's already ready made for you. Or you could even modify the activity itself, you know, maybe adjust, maybe you have some students that are really high flyers and you want to make sure that they're going a little bit deeper. You could take that transcript white out some of the terms and have students fill in the term as they're listening to the video or the audio and follow along and make it kind of a two prong atta um, attack of how they can be sharpening their skills. There's so many things that you can do with this, but again, making sure our students feel confident and that they can access and understand to be able to go through that process properly. And then on the flip side, we talked about, you know, we have script for all the audios and videos, and we also have uh, recordings and audios for all of our scripts or our reading activities. 
Um, this is such a great thing to have. I know not every material has this, but I think this is such a great resource. And again, we as teachers, we can also create this too. We can record ourselves reading certain things to help deepen comprehension. Of course, we know this is great. So many students who have modifications or accommodations for you know any disabilities or difficulties. Uh, but again, it also offers flexibility for you as a teacher. You can turn any reading into a listening if you wanted to. Um, and you can also have students listen to the material being read aloud to work on their vocabulary, their pronunciation, their speed and intonation. There's a lot of different things that you can do that can help support you. And I think something that's interesting, um, you know, a teacher spoke to me about this and was like, well, if I give this to some of my students, even if they don't need it, some of them are just going to use it to cheat. And I think that that is a valid point. Um, it's a concern that I've exper I've personally experienced. I certainly, my crusade when I started teaching was I wanted to eliminate cheating. And then I kind of got over that kind of quickly because I realized there was really no way for me to eliminate it entirely. Of course, we can limit it. We can kind of do things to kind of prohibit it or to, you know, maybe even have consequences for it. But to completely eliminate it from our classrooms is a high ask um, for us as teachers beyond what we already have on our plates. Um, and to that, what I say is I would rather have my students have too much support so that way they can feel more confident in their next touch with the language than to have my students leave my classroom feeling like they don't know what's going on. They feel like they're failing. They feel like they're stupid. Um, if we can give them more things to feel more confident in those interactions with the language, we know that touches, meaningful touches of language equal success, equal proficiency. So if we can aid in that and give them that confidence to begin utilizing it more and more, that is going to give them the opportunity to stand on their feet independently and to work with the material independently with more confidence and more success. So for me, that is more than worth it. And again, like I said, there's so many students who fall through the cracks that never get diagnosed with a 504 and IEP um, and need them. I, I want to make sure I'm meeting those students, even if they don't have that advocate or that person in their life to give them those, those, those things to them. So that's how I feel about it. But again, you can utilize your discretion with your students because you know them better than anybody else and what works best for you in your classroom. One thing I really love that we offer with our MAPA series, which is so cool talking about audios and readings is with the MAPA series, we have Textos Locutados. Um, this is also available in Defi Francophone, which is one of our French materials. Um, and what it is, is that for every single one of the reading activities, there are audios that allow for the students to play the reading in different accents. Um, so for the French, we have uh, French and Quebecois for our accents. And for Spanish, we have Colombiano, Mexicano, Espanol, and Caribeño. And I think that's amazing that we have that because of course, we sometimes have limited options for the accents that our students are exposed to in the classroom. Um, this is a really great tool for pronunciation and mimicking and you know student sharpening. And again, flexibility for you as a teacher. You can modify any reading into a listening activity and deepen that comprehension. I think that's such a great thing to do. And then certainly for me, I think the options, options, options is always one of the best ways to kind of modify the process. What is the ways, the supports that we're giving them to get them through that bridge to that other side to get to that finish line we talked about? Um, and so some things for those are um, sometimes seemingly overwhelming. For example, choice boards. Choice boards, when I started teaching, I mean, like really great in theory, but seemed like I was going to do so much extra work to prepare them. Um, and then I found out a way that worked for me to do it. Um, that I'm going to share with you that I think makes it a lot easier. And it was also, I talked about those surveys at the end of the year when I did my surveys and said, what best helped you also during the four quarter ones. This was always one of the top things that I got from my students saying that they loved this. Um, so what I would do was Starbucks study day. Um, if you don't know, this was like popular on social media a little while ago. Some teachers were like, this is Starbucks day. So when you come in, you have the Starbucks logo on the board or Dunkin' or whatever works for you. And then your students know that they're like in a coffee shop that day and they're going to come in and like, you're going to put your headphones in and just get your work done. You're not going to bother and be the weird person in the coffee shop that talks to everybody while they're trying to get their work done. You're just going to put your head down, get your stuff done and then leave, you know? And some teachers really loved it. They like went all out. They got like, they brought in coffee and hot chocolate for their kids. 
I didn't do that. I did not trust my students with boiling hot beverages in my classroom. You do what works for you. Uh, but just the theme itself kind of mixed things up a little bit. And it also just always set a clear tone for my students for what this actually looked like. So this was kind of how I did a choice board. So I did this before any major assessment, um, whether it was like, you know, a vocabulary or, or grammar quiz, um, whether it was a, a project or a presentation, um, maybe like a midterm or final, anything like that, any types of assessment where I knew there were going to be demonstrating mastery and I want to make sure they were sharpening all the skills that were going to be on that assessment, I would do a Starbucks study day. So what I would do is I would create a PowerPoint um, slide that was like similar to the one that you see on the right. And so I would just have on each slide a link to the different activities that are here. So here are the ones that are available to you. Um, and then there was always one activity that I had that was mandatory. You had to do it, this activity before the end of class. And that was always a Google Form study guide. It was what I did that they had to do because I knew 100% if they did that study guide, they were going to hit all of the skills I knew they needed to hit before they went into that assessment. So I knew that was super essential. But other than that, everything else was not anything I created from scratch or redid. It was all of the activities that I had done throughout the unit or throughout the week or whatever in preparation up to that assessment. And I know some people have asked me, they're like, well, aren't students going to be like, well, we already did this. And I'm like, well, yeah, some students did say that. I'm like, great. Now you're going to be amazing on it because you're doing it again. I can't wait to see you get a hundred or, you know, they'd be like, oh, we already did this. I'd be like, oh, if you want something different, I've got some really great worksheets I would love to give you, you know? So there's things that you can give them. And again, most of the kids, honestly, never said a word. They loved the opportunity to just kind of practice independently and work on what they needed. So I told them the only rules are you have to, you know, kind of work well. You have to be working. You can do any of the activities that you would like. And you have to work the whole period and you have to get that Google form done before the end of class. You have to do the study guide. Um, then I know they're hitting all the things they need to do. And I'll tell you what, some kids, they did the study guide and then they did Quizlet for the rest of class. I don't care. They were working with vocabulary. And to me, that's great. They're working with their vocabulary. Some kids really use it to actually like, you know, really work with me. They'd come over and ask for extra help. Some kids would just work with their peers, but it was just a great way for them to have a stop and pause. And I'll tell you why it was probably one of the most popular things I had that again, every time at the end of the year during those surveys, they were saying this was what helped me was because we know, again, our kids, social emotional learning have lives and things going on beyond our classroom. So many kids have jobs, they have sports, they have younger siblings they have to work for, um, take care of. A lot of them don't have the time to dedicate to study for your quizzes and tests as much as we'd like them to. And so dedicating that time in class, not only is make sure, making for you, guaranteeing that your students are getting study time and the prep that you want them to, but it's also going to show them that you care and support them to get that study time that they need. And if they want to put in extra time, they great, they can. But if they don't, and this is all they get, at least they got something, you know, and that's so important, I think. Another great thing that we can do to provide them and process and help support them are organizers. I think there's no such thing as too much organizers. Um, I know for me, and I'm sure for many of you, I had a ton of 504s and IEPs that required that I provided organizers, you know, for example, you know, breaking down those projects and things like that. So what I would do again, start with the most and go backwards. If I had, for example, a project, I used to do a midterm project where students were doing presentations um, on legends. And so that was a lot of work for them to go through an entire legend and be able to practice and present it and, you know, get the conjugations right. They were doing credit versus imperfect. So there was, it was a lot to it. So what I would do is I made this huge organizer where it was like a whole packet. So it was like, here's one to, for you to show me that you understand what the legend was telling you. Now here's one where I want you to show me how you're going to retell this legend to someone else. Here's one where you're going to go through all the conjugations and justify preterite versus imperfect for each one. You know, every little piece of the project that I needed to make sure that they were sharp on, I had an organizer for that. At the beginning of the project, I would give it to everyone and say, if you're an organizer person and this is going to help you, great. Use it. Awesome. I'm not an organizer person. I'm like a stream of consciousness person. So I never really liked organizers as a kid and I hated being forced to use them because they didn't really facilitate my flow. And so I would tell them, if you're not an organizer person, don't do it. But then what I would do is I would incorporate at least minimum of one in-person check where I would go in and check in with every single student how they're doing on the project. And I, if they were not where I needed them to be on maybe like the second or third day, I'd be like, all right, well, 
it seems you thought you didn't need this organizer, but now you do. And so now it's mandatory. Now you have to use this organizer because you're having trouble organizing your thoughts, getting where you need to go with the work. And so now I'm going to do this. But so for my students who needed it, they had it. The ones who didn't, they didn't need it. They didn't, they had it, but they didn't use it. And I'd rather, you know, have it and not need it than need it and not have it, you know? So again, that same mentality with our students, giving them those additional options and supports so that if they need to, they can differentiate for themselves. Or if we need to step in and say, you need to differentiate with this, I can give you these materials and help support you. And let's go through this together. Another really awesome thing that we can do is utilize AI. I can't emphasize enough um, how excited I get now seeing all of the AI things that are being incorporated in a lot of learning platforms and how they could have made my life easier as a teacher. And I hope you're using them to make your life easier. Um, one great um, platform that I loved when I was teaching was Quizzes. I believe it's still free. Um, and this is really cool because now not only is this a great kind of interactive PowerPoint thing, like I showed you earlier with uh, Pear Deck and uh, Nearpod, it makes it a little bit more of a gamified experience. It's got like music and blah, blah, blah. I also really love this because different than like a Kahoot, for example, you can do fill in the blank questions. So for me as a language teacher, this was great because of course we know production of the language is key. So being able to quiz my students in like a game way where they had to like, you know, produce a conjugation, that was awesome for me. So I loved that. Um, but what I love now is that they have these options to do differentiation. So for example, what I did um, is one, it's great to start as a springboard. I'm not saying you should have AI make all of your lessons. I don't think that's a good idea. We would tell our students not to do plagiarizing through, you know, an AI. So we shouldn't do it either. Of course, you not need to check, but it's a great starting point. No different than our students, you know, they can use Google Translate or something to help support them. It could be a tool for proficiency, but it obviously shouldn't be the whole thing that you're doing to produce your work. So what I did was I took an episode of Bluey. If you don't know Bluey, Bluey is amazing. It's a kid show. And they have, uh, Bluey has a whole channel in Spanish where they have their episodes in Spanish. I love using kids YouTube videos, like kids shows, YouTube videos for videos for my students because Kid shows are meant to facilitate language learning. Um, you know, they're going to repeat the word a bunch of times. They're going to like show it as they're talking about it. They're going to talk more slowly. Um, it's meant for language acquisition. So it's great for students in language acquisition for Spanish. You know, I always say to my kids, like, you're like a first and second grader in Spanish, you know, so you got to pull it back. So I love using kid shows like Peppa Pig and Bluey and stuff to help do videos. And so I took a video from Bluey's Spanish channel on YouTube. And I did this this morning. So this is like a current thing you can do. And they let you upload a video link from YouTube and then it will create questions for you on quizzes. Were these perfect? No, they were not. Um, but you could change the language so you can have them create them in Spanish. Um, and then you can have them at least as a basis for you to modify them. And then what's really, really cool is once you get like that basis going and you feel good about it, they even have an entire tab for how to differentiate those materials even further. So if you want to take again and make a, a diff additional activities really help deepen that comprehension, this will give you the opportunity. Like you can see here, reducing options. That's a way that you can differentiate. Add answer explanation. This is great for grammar. You know, students get it wrong. Okay, well, why did you get it wrong? Here's an answer explanation. Like, oh, you forgot, don't forget, you have to put this in the yo form before you switch the ending and add blah, blah, blah. You know, there's so many great things that we could do to support them. And this is just helping us. It's not only giving us the idea of how we can differentiate, because sometimes that's the hardest part, but it can actually facilitate the actual creation of this. And again, I think this is awesome. It's those small changes that can make a big difference. Another fantastic one in regards to process is helping having students use AI for themselves. Again, helping support students differentiate for their own needs again. So this is a really great thing. Quizlet has this really cool new feature where you can do like an AI study buddy, which I think is really neat. I tried it out, was super impressed with it, to be honest. Um, I was a big fan of Quizlet Learn when I was teaching because it, like I said, I told students, it like learns what you know and what you don't know. And if it, it thinks you know it, it's going to stop sending it to you to study. And if it thinks you don't know it, it's going to keep sending it to you until you solidify it and you learn it. So what's great about this is that this uses artificial intelligence to support that and go even further. So you can take a vocab list, have it quiz the students on it, you know, and say, what is this? What is that? You know, there's even a feature for teaching things. Again, the teaching feature is not the best because it's not going to give as good of an explanation as you, the teacher would. Our jobs are secure, but it's really going to give you the support that you need 
to, um, you know, solidify their skills and they can do this independently outside of the class. This could be an excellent suggestion for you. When I talked about earlier, giving suggestions on how to prove those can do statements, students are struggling with X, Y, Z use Quizlet AI study buddy to work on this Quizlet set that talks about, you know, irregular verbs or talks about preterite or whatever it may be, you know, help them help themselves. So that way, even when you're not there, they can still get differentiation. Differentiating for products. I think this is one of the easiest ways that we can differentiate. And it's also often one of the first ways we think about differentiation. You know, what is your modification for what is the final product that you want them to be able to produce? What do you want them to be able to do at the end of things? And if you modify and change that, you obviously are going to get different levels of difficulty. And this is, I like I said, one of the ways I think it can be one of the easiest. As we can see here, we're getting these materials from, you know, the reporter series. And the only difference here is that you're modifying the product in regards to the number of words. The left-hand side, they're doing the same prompt. They're doing 80 to 100 words versus the right-hand side of 150 to 200 words. No additional prep, different levels of engagement, different levels of difficulty. And again, this is a, a way that you can differentiate. Another great way that we can look at differentiation in regards to product is some of the different ways that you can format that. And again, we're going to look at those differentiation worksheets I talked about before. So here is the textbook, our middle of the row. The students are going to be answering questions about those students they were reading about and their different music likes and dislikes and different types of styles. So they're answering these questions. And again, they have that support on the right hand side for the verb gusar. Then on the left-hand side, we have option A, our accommodation. So it's going to have them break the process down a little bit more to help support them. So it's going to say, you know, go in and highlight some of these things in yellow, green, and pink to help you with your understanding of the reading before I go about asking you to answer questions about the reading. Um, they're even going to have them do some matching first to help support. Again, so modifying the product rather than an open-ended question, matching, you know, rather than a multiple choice fill in the blank, rather than a true or false, true or false and correct the false, you know, small changes that can make a very big difference. Um, and then for the last one, what we have, oh, we got stuck behind the other one. <laughs> um, if you could see it, you would see that they are doing open-ended questions plus additional prompts, you know, what do you see about this reading? Now, additional prompt, tell me more about your own thoughts and feelings on X, Y, Z, um, you know, and these are little changes. Oh, there it is. Uh, <laughs> little changes that can make a very big difference um, into our students and their process and how they are going about doing things. I love that we regularly incorporate in our materials. Um, you know, I want a challenge. Uh, students can sometimes want to do additional work and want to challenge themselves. We do have some great high flyers. I had one kid one time who taught himself the present subjunctive over the summer. I was blown away. He was amazing at it. And he just did that on his own. He was excited about it and wanted to know how to do it. And he did. And it was incredible. So, you know, don't underestimate what your kids can do. Your high flyers can sometimes do really amazing work. And we want to give them the opportunity and the chances to do those things and challenge themselves. Again, some of these things, again, we don't want to create additional prep time. You know, those worksheets I just showed you, if you're going to modify a worksheet, that takes additional prep time. Sometimes you don't always have that. Sometimes you end up needing differentiation in the moment. So what can you do in those scenarios? So here's an example from MAPAS. In the actual activity, the students are listening to a video. We're doing an interpretive video activity, and they're answering some questions about what their likes and dislikes are. And then the planning um, you know, material, the teacher's annotated edition, it gives us some um, suggestions on how we can uh, differentiate. So now we're saying, all right, well, maybe you have some kids that are done with this already and they're just sitting there bored. What can you do? So you can now change and say, all right, well, if you're done with this already, those of you still working, great, keep going. Those of you who are done already, now what I want you to do is I want you to create a survey about music for your peers. So take some time and I want you to create a survey about what are students' likes and dislikes in regards to different artists or different types of music or instruments, et cetera. Then you can go one step further and say, all right, now those of you who are done with the video, start working on the survey. Those of you who finished with the survey, now I want you to find someone else in the class who finished the survey and I want you to interview each other. So now you have taken a simple activity, which was a viewing activity. Then you went in and you did an interpersonal writing activity. And then they went one step further and then they turned it into an interpersonal speaking activity. Again, no extra prep. You're just directing them verbally what you want them to do to 
modify the material and modify the product of what you want them to be able to do. Uh, so this is a great example of that. I think it's so easy and sometimes we just don't think of those. I think it's great to keep a list of things that you know that you can do. You know, that I was always told when I was in my master's degree, like you should have a bag of tricks in your back pocket that you can pull out at any time. This is a great example of what is in that bag of tricks. I like could not figure that out in my master's. I was like, what is this bag of tricks I need to have? That's a great example. Having a list of small modifications that you can do to any topic, any project to turn it, you know, from instead of a writing to now start do a speaking, you know, instead of a speaking, do, you know, a listening. How can you modify and address more skills, personalized to the skill and the mode, not just the actual learner? Um, and then, you know, for examples here, I love this. This is something really great that we have in the reporter series, our annotated teachers edition. Always have suggestions for differentiation beyond those materials. For example, boosting your teaching. I think it's really important to remember how we might want to modify things for different types of learners. Like we can see here, visual learners and auditory learners. How can we accommodate for them? Or again, having small little tweaks. Again, these are not huge lists of things that you have to go in and prep and change and print. These are just small little modifications that you can make to have them adjust things in the moment and have different levels of capability beyond what you have originally in the material. Again, I really want to emphasize how many things are at your fingertips that you can utilize to facilitate this process and make it a little bit easier for you. And again, another great resource is using artificial intelligence, specifically here with ChatGPT. So this is an example of the beginning of each of our chapters. We start each of our reporter series with our reporters. They're different students from throughout the Spanish and French speaking world. And they always start a video off at the beginning, introducing themselves and the region that they're from and where we're going to be learning about. Um, they're really cute, fun videos, and I think they're fantastic. So I decide, all right, well, in this activity in the bottom right hand corner, they're doing comprehension activities for this video. And what they decided to do was a true and false. And I'm like, I don't really love this. I have some kids that are like super challenging this class. Maybe I even have a blended class. I have an honors French that's in this class with my academic French. What do I do for them? Now I have to come up with that, something for them to do. They're going to be bored. So what I used was I used chat GPT to help support me. So we know from earlier, we talked about how all of our videos come with a script. So I went into chat GPT. I put the script into ChatGPT and I said, please create five comprehension questions for the, the, the script, aka the video, and create them for me. So now it created five open-ended questions. Are these perfect? No. Why? Well, maybe you have to modify them? Potentially. Or maybe I could just leave them as they are. Sometimes ChatGPT really hits the nail on the head. And now I have a differentiated product. I went from true or false, and now I have open-ended questions. Or... Maybe I want to change and I don't want to have like different true or false questions. I want to literally address the exact same things that are in that those true and false questions. But instead of true and false, I want to make them open ended. So all I did was I took chat GPT. I said, can you take these five questions and turn or four questions and change them from true to false to open ended? And it did. Um, and again, are these perfect? No. For example, for number four, um, it says, you know, does uh, Yasser likes basketball in the video that would be a false he talks about how he likes football um, uh, yeah football or soccer um, so the question number four which are what are his interests interest if any beyond basketball that's not a, a good question because he doesn't have an interest in basketball he has an interest in football or soccer so that is one thing I would potentially have to modify but again me as a teacher I can do that and this gave me a great starting point so instead of I could say what are his interests beyond football and that or soccer and that's it. That's all I had to change. And now, great, I have some additional questions or some modified questions that are modified in product and are going to either challenge or accommodate based off of what my needs are for those different classes. And lastly, learning environment. I think it's really important to never underestimate how your learning environment can change what the differentiation process looks like. Uh, personally, I just think environment's really important. My students uh, had previously said that some of the classrooms in their school looked like a jail cell. Who wants to learn in a jail cell? Um, you know, and for some things, there are little things or big things that we can do that can help our students feel more comfortable. Again, we know how hard it can be to sit in a language classroom. What can we do to support that? So one thing is setting the tone, having clear instructions, having our students know what the expectations are very easily. Um, one thing, again, you could use PowerPoint slides. I sometimes had the, the wherewithal to create PowerPoint slides ahead of time. 
Sometimes I didn't. And so this was one great resource I loved. Um, you can see at the bottom, it gives you the website, it's classroomscreen.com. I loved this website. It just gives you a great little batch of tools. You can see the little toolbar at the bottom to create like a little home screen that I would put up on the board and I would have this. I love to use this after quizzes and tests because obviously I want my students to be quiet while other students are still working. Maybe I've got time and a half kids, but I want other kids to do other stuff. So I have a list because I'm telling you right now, if you're going to tell your students before the quiz what you want them to do after the quiz, they can't hear you. Their brain is literally just like, I'm going to fail this quiz. I'm going to fail this quiz. Or like just trying to like hold on to all the information so they could brain dump it onto the paper in one minute when you give it to them. So they're going to forget everything you said. Don't get mad and that's not your fault. It's not their fault. It's just life. So I always put the instructions for after the quiz on the board. I would go over them. But then after that, I'd be like, look at the board. Look at the board. It's on the board. You should be doing what's on the board. I, you know, you can make really simple instructions. I think most people could probably, oh, I spelled soccer wrong. Sorry, I originally had it in use studies form. So it was sock <laughs> um, So I put these, what I assume, and I think these are pretty easy. Probably even most of our non-Spanish speakers could figure out what this is. Um, and so they're doing these clear step-by-step -step things. I'm showing them I want them to be silent. There's a clock up there because my students always wanted to know what time it was so they could see how much time they had left. And for some classrooms, that's the back of the room. So you don't want kids whipping their head around during a quiz. So you have it up there on the board. Maybe it's a timer. You have so much left for this activity before the blah, blah, blah. Great act things that you can put up there. I loved classroom screen. It really helped me set the tone and made my learning environment just easier for both of us, both myself and my students. Also, seating and ambiance can be a really great way to modify. I really encourage you to use a classroom set setup to facilitate your instruction. Um, you know, for example, it, the right hand side, the pair, those groups of four, that was my setup of choice. That's how I had my classroom most days. But if I choose today, I'm going to do a paired speaking. It's very hard to do a paired speaking if you have a group of four because you're trying to talk to the person next to you. But guess what? Across from you on your other side is another conversation happening in Spanish of uh, uh, e, uh, <laughs> and you're trying to focus on what you want to say and then they're throwing you off and you're throwing them off and you're copying them. There's so much going on. So facilitating that instruction by organizing the desk appropriately can help do that. These groups are great for group activities, for games, for a group discussion, you know, that's awesome. Same thing on the left-hand side. What's going on on the left-hand side is not good if you're doing a group activity, it'd be hard, but that's perfect for like direct instruction. So that way all the students are facing the front of the board and everyone can see equally versus on the right-hand side, that student who's right in front of my desk, they can't see the board. They have to physically turn their body around and that's not a good learning environment for them. And it really doesn't have to be hard to modify your desk I know that, that sometimes it can feel like it's a lot. I didn't want to move on my desk all the time, every period. But then I figured out a shortcut. I would just make a visual of what I wanted my seats to look like. I would put it up on the board. I'd make like a little PowerPoint slide with like a visual of the desks. And then I would put it up. And as kids were coming into class, I'd be like, hey, do that. Hey, do that. Hey, do that. And I would force them to start helping me. So that way we got it done before the bell even rang. It was great. So utilize that to help differentiate for facilitating instruction. Seating and ambience, again, you don't have to have a Pinterest perfect classroom. I personally, this was my classroom, so I was one of those teachers. I loved that, but that was because it was something that made me happy, okay? I spent almost my entire day in that room. I wanted to love it as much as I love my home. So I spent time and money dedicated to that. And that's fine for me. If it doesn't work for you, then that's fine too. But I will tell you, if you do want to achieve this, but you don't have all the time, you don't have all the money, it is easier than it seems. Um, I'll give you some hacks. One, uh, Garland makes everything look nice and they're cheap. You can usually get really, really cheap ones from dollar store, five below, whatever it is. I will say, speaking of five below, if almost everything in these pictures is from five below, um, it's really, really great. If you have one in your area, everything's like $5 or below. They've kind of modified that a bit, but still things are pretty inexpensive. Same thing with dollar stores. Um, also, Camping chairs are phenomenal for flexible seating because they're so durable. They're meant to be closed and picked up and moved and then put in rough terrain. You know, they can withstand your middle schoolers. Um, I had those for years. They never broke. Um, and it was really, really great to have them because I could just collapse them and get rid of them if I needed to. And usually at the end of summer, they're super cheap because they go on mega sale. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And then my last tip for if you want to have a, you know, classroom like this, on the left hand side, you can see lots of pillows. Pillows are expensive. I'm sure many people who are here know that. They're like, 
you get one pill for $25 and you're like, why? Why is this $25 for one pillow? So I will give you a hint. Most of those are actually dog beds from like home goods and, and like, again, like five below. Um, this is a really great hack that you can use that makes it super easy. They're always like really fun prints and like Again, they're durable because they're for dogs who have like little nails and stuff. So that's a really great thing that I would use that make excellent pillows and they're bigger so that, you know, two students could sit in them if you wanted to. And then this is what I utilize for those Starbucks days. My students um, knew that during those days they were allowed to go and use the space to kind of just chill, work on their own, just like if it was a coffee shop and get their work done. And then the last thing to help set the tone um, is YouTube videos, YouTube backgrounds. Um, you'd be surprised how much a video up on the screen projecting for like independent work or silent work can actually really make a huge difference. Again, that social emotional learning perspective, just making your students feel a little bit more at home and more at peace in what can be a stressful environment. Um, some of them are really great. The one on the left was one of my favorites for the winter. Um, it really makes it look like if you have the lights off, like you're literally looking through a window and like the wind is blowing. It's very cool. The one on the right, basically a sedative. I don't know what is in that videos, but every time I put it on, I think it was the jazz and the rain in the background. It just like made all my students just be like, and they all just worked and were quiet. I don't know what it is, but it's great. Just remember, of course, always preview them. There's hundreds, if not thousands of videos like this online. Some of them are great. Some of them are really distracting. You know, there's a lot of like aquarium ones. Don't recommend those. I would watch that aquarium all day instead of do my work. So just remember, think of your with your student brain. And then last but not least, to help support you with this, there's nothing worse than when you put up a video, it's playing, and then all of a sudden an ad comes through and is like screaming like something about like, do you love Taco Tuesday? And you're like, oh my God. So then your students start laughing, they're off topic, and you're like, oh, this wonderful ambience I just created is destroyed. So what you can do is um, there's some websites that you can do to put in the YouTube link, and it will make it so that there's no ads no comments, nothing. You can also use that to share links with your students if you ever want to send them a YouTube video, but you're worried about what the comments are or what's going to show up on the suggestions or what ad is going to play beforehand. Um, one that I can suggest um, is video.link. You can see it on the bottom of the screen. That's a great one that you can use um, to project videos in class so there's no ads or to help send videos to your students and, um, you know, do some extra activities in class. So, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all so much for uh, listening to me talk. Um, and now I believe that we might have some questions that I can go over. Yes, we do have some questions. Uh, just before that, I just wanted to remember everyone that we are always open to giving you more PD opportunities. So we're gonna put in a second the link in case you want to know more about the different professional development opportunities you can have and we're also going to put the link to our website in case you want to check in the meantime the manuals that we saw in the presentation such as reporteros reporter francophone mapas and so on so let's go for those questions so the first one is uh, the person mentions that they struggle with mobilizing the information that they collect and also with so many things to ask that sometimes they make their, their surveys too large. So, Christy, what are your suggestions to effectively mobilize the information and also focus? It's a great question. Um, certainly, I'll start with the survey first. Um, if you know you make your surveys too large, it is easy to lose students or to get too much information that can kind of clog the information that you're getting. And like you say, effectively mo mobilize it and focus. Um, so I definitely would use your previous surveys to kind of inform what to utilize on other surveys. You can also even survey about your surveys. Was the survey effective for you or was there too much information? You know, you can, and again, that doesn't have to be a full survey. You can just ask your students in class and say, what did you think about that? Were there too many questions just right? You know, um, and I think one of the best ways we can, you know, mobilize this information and focus is um, start with one specific thing that you learned from that or have an objective when creating your questions of what might be able to help support you. What do you want to get out of this to be able to mobilize and move forward? Um, so I would 
come up with a clear objective of what you want to get out of that and then focus on that objective. You know, don't let the other information that you may receive coincidentally clog your process. Um, and then definitely use that information to kind of make your next steps. What can you do to help modify or do you need to maybe reteach something? Do you maybe need to adjust your activities that you're doing next week in class? Um, do you maybe need to repeat an activity and kind of get some more information out of it so that way you can help understand your students' needs a little bit better. Uh, that would be my suggestion on that. Again, don't overcomplicate something that can be simplistic as long as you're going through the actual step-by-steps um, and using it to really support you and to support your students. If you're finding it's not supporting you, if it's not giving you what you need, if it's overwhelming you, it's not effective. Um, so if their surveys are too large, cut them down, you know, cut it in half if you want, see how it does, and then go from there. Fantastic. So our next question says, how do you bring the different levels together in conversation after doing these separate activities? That's a really good question. Um, it certainly is challenging when you have a lot of students in different levels and then you're going into a conversation activity or doing an interpersonal speaking and you still know you have students with different levels. I know obviously it's very um there's a lot of diverse opinions on whether or not you should keep students tracked and, you know, students who may be in your lower group are stay together or students who are in your higher group should be in the lower group to help support them. I personally, I used to do random speakings where I would literally have the kids come up and randomly shuffle and get new groups every single time. I personally think that it's the best way to do conversations because it's the most organic um, I think that you're often going to have times where you, if you are to speaking in the target language, you'll be speaking with people of varying levels. Sometimes you'll be speaking with, I'll be speaking with a native speaker. Sometimes I'll be speaking with another colleague who learned Spanish as a second language. Sometimes I'll be speaking with someone who's just trying to learn Spanish and they want to practice with me. That is an organic process. That is a realistic real world scenario. You will not always be matched with someone who has the exact same levels of you and you need to be able to adjust. Same thing as I always tell my students, you may not always get the opportunity to speak with your best friend in Spanish. Maybe it's going to be a stranger because you need help getting on the train and wherever you are. Um, so I always tried to make sure that I was circulating the different speakers as much as possible and using that as an opportunity for students to spring more of that conversation. So sometimes they had really excellent conversations. Sometimes it wasn't as, as great, but as long as you are regularly doing it in class, again, having those meaningful touches with the language is never going to be a bad thing. It's always going to be something that's going to support and uh, encourage our proficiency uh, process. So um, I would just say, do it as much and as you know randomly as possible, no matter their level, and use that to help them focus. Fantastic. Now, our next question would be if you have any more examples for organizers. Mm. Examples for organizers. Yes, I mean, there's lots of different organizers that you could use. Um, I Obviously, there were some activities where I created my own active um, organizer dependent upon the activity. Some of them I found online. Um, one thing I think is really great is you can actually get a lot of really great free organizers for English, like English class. You know, when students are doing a reading, um, there's tons of organizers out there for like figuring out the plot and, you know, what was the climax and like, what was, what do you think, you know, before this? And then what do you learn? And then now what do you actually know? There are so many different organizers that are already out there um, that you can use and facilitate to kind of just adapt to whatever your target language is. Sometimes you don't also even have to put them in the target language. If it's meant to be an organizer that's going to help them with their process in the target language, I think for some of these activities, it's perfectly fine to keep them in English. So that way it's going to help them to organize for when their thoughts go into Spanish. So um, it would guess, I guess my suggestion would be it would really be dependent upon what the activity is. Uh, but certainly I think start off and there's a, a really great way that you can go and get them just for free offline. Or again, I encourage you to make your own. There's a lot of great things that you can create because you know exactly what you want your students to get out of those organizers as well. Great, thank you. Now, another question is if Watchkins or Videolink, if these platforms are free. 
Um, as far as video watchkins, I don't know that one specifically. Um, but video link, the one that I mentioned in my presentation, when I went in and used it today, it was completely free. You can sign up for a membership if you want to like save things and edit them and be able to use them later. Um, I didn't find that was necessary. I did not have to create a membership to be able to create a, a, a new link. Um, and to be able to just have a video presentation of a different video from YouTube with no ads. So again, um, maybe just do a little bit of research just to be sure, but specifically for the um, video link, it is definitely not a paid subscription. You can use it for free um, and it's great. So it's always nice to not have to deal with ads on YouTube videos for sure. Absolutely. Um now, unless we get another one, this would be our last question. And it mentions if the worksheets you mentioned in the presentation can be assigned to students and how can the person assign those worksheets for differentiation to their students? Sometimes the platforms, for some reason, maybe don't want to allow them to. Yes, this is actually something I was actually just speaking to my supervisor about um, how we want to facilitate this to be something that's easily assigned for students. Um, currently, there's not a way for us to assign the differentiation worksheets um, for specifically Puerto Porteros or Puerto Francophone uh, because they are not in the HTML interactive proportion portion of the platform. But it is something that we are currently working on to integrate into the platform to be able to be assigned. So if you're a current user of one of these materials and you want to be able to assign them digitally, it's something that we're currently working on. However, these are great activities that you can do in class that you can have the students do and print out and do independently. I think that's actually a great way to do this because these are really good to do as classwork. It's not something I would really recommend. Often, if you're going to do a differentiated activity, it's not something I would recommend that you collect and do as a grade just because this is really meant to build the formative process. It really shouldn't be used as a summative. Um, so I would really recommend just doing them as they are kind of formatted right now, which is printing them out. And I always recommend to teachers, you can either have, you know, them assigned to your students based off of a previous assessment, off of last night's homework, today's entrance ticket, or you could have students choose for themselves which one they want to do based off of their own comfort level. And you can even kind of encourage it, like say, you know, hey, for those of you who got, you know, a 90 or above on last week's quiz, I really would love to see you challenge yourselves by doing this activity here. Um, you know, those of you who maybe got this grade or below, if you want a little extra support to kind of help you really get it, or if you want to go over it with me, I'm here for you. But this would be a great task to help you really get the full breakdown so you can feel confident on our next activity. You know, help explaining it to them. I think that sometimes people think that differentiation needs to be something that's hidden. I think it's very obvious to many students that we all have different skills. I'm always kind of plain and open with them. Like I am not a math person. It has never been my strength. I need so much differentiation when it comes to math and skills like in that. It's just not who I am. Um, but I love languages. And does that mean that I'm dumb in math class? No, it doesn't mean that I'm a genius in Spanish class. No, it just means that we all have different strengths and weaknesses that we need to continue to work on. And so I think being frank with our students about that and helping them with that process so they can continue to do that for themselves throughout their lives beyond our classrooms is a positive thing. I don't think we have to hide and say, oh, if they find out they're doing a different worksheet, then they're going to be mad. You know, it doesn't have to be that we can support their own independence and, you know, responsibility for their learning by educating them on what that looks like and giving them the tools to facilitate that process and kind of keep doing that. Fantastic. And it's fun that you mentioned math because actually we got like another question in the meantime, which is related. And the person just mentions that if they are just starting a new math lesson, how can you implement differentiation in that case? Uh, for a math lesson. They mentioned it's a math lesson, but maybe <laughs> how could we maybe mix a bit of both somehow? Yes. I mean, uh, luckily, I, I actually was just talking to a friend about this. I think people underestimate how much math and language are actually connected. I don't know about other schools, but for example, my master's program, all of the language teachers were paired with math teachers because math and language are both skill-based subjects. You know, I always said to my students, just like math, you can't forget two plus two just because we're moving on to two times two. You need to build off that building block and keep going. Same thing with grammar and, and language. You know, you can't forget all of your previous vocab or grammar 
as we move into new topics, we have to be able to, you know, use that to build and get better and grow and add more skills on top of that. So I do think, and also I think grammar and language can be quite formulaic, you know, for example, I used to teach the present subjunctive as a, a very strict formula um, for students to be able to conjugate it appropriately with all the specific points. Um, but I think that um, one of the ways that you can do it in regards to introducing a topic in regards to direct instruction with any subject, whether it's math or language, um, is I think really focusing on that topic where we talked about the process, allowing for accessibility for your students. Um, so for example, if we're doing a direct instruction, being able to provide your students with the notes afterwards to be able to go back and check or go over those things with you. Doing stop points during the middle, incorporating that into your time and your presentation to be able to go over or do a check-in point, you know, having, like I said, use Pear Deck to insert a comprehension question to say, are we understanding it so far? Or am I just talking to a brick wall and no one understands me and I lost them 10 minutes ago, you know? So I think that using that process portion of what we talked about today and really focusing on that um, can be an excellent way for us to make sure that we're differentiating in regards to instruction rather than where a lot of these, I think, um, focus is into practice and assessment. Um, and so if we focus on the process, that can help facilitate our instruction portion um, and really benefit us and our students. Fantastic. So that was the actual last question. So again, thank you very much, Christy, for this amazing presentation. Uh, just before we all leave, we had some questions in the chat. So firstly, uh, I sent before the link for the certificates. Uh, it does look like it's just an attendance list, but we just need the full name and your full email address, the correct one. So we will send you that then everyone will receive the recording of the presentation alongside the slides, the PowerPoint. So if you have any issues in the meantime, if you could not see the presentation, we will send it to you and you will be able to see the whole presentation as well. So no worries in there. Also, if you have any questions, as you can see here, Christy placed her email. You can also send us an email to spanish at cletwl.com or to french at cletwl.com. Those were the languages of the books we presented. We will be able to help you with that. And just like a final reminder again that we have other PD opportunities. So if you want to know more about our professional development, please feel free to visit us. And you can always subscribe to our newsletter and we will let you know so keep posted because we will do some webinars in the future and I hope you'll have a really nice evening. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.